Hello and welcome to Inside Chat, which is Inside F2's opportunity to share the insight of how the Formula 2 Championship works and the people that make it happen. My guest today is Team Principal and Director of High Tech Grand Prix, Ollie Oakes. And thank you so much, Holly, for joining us today. Yeah, no worries. My pleasure. So first of all, um, I think we'd all actually like to know a little bit more about you and you know, your <laughs> career so far and a bit of a driving career in there, being 2005 World Karting Champion. So if you can elaborate, that'd be great. Yeah, um, yeah I'm thinking where to start. Actually. It's a bit weird, isn't it? Um, yes, yeah, so I used to race a long time ago. My one claim to fame you mentioned, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, and then, yeah, basically I raced all the way up into F3 level, I guess. Then I, I stopped. Then I did a little bit of the sort of time out. Then I did some GT stuff. And then I kind of came back um, a bit unorthodox, really. I, I worked with some young drivers. And then um, in 2015, yeah, I started high tech. Um, and then sort of, yeah. I guess the last five years from doing that, obviously lots has gone on and very busy, but yeah, pretty cool as well to be almost on the other side of the fence, really, when you're a, a team boss from having been a driver, I guess it's quite, I don't think there's too many actually who do that. Yeah. No, yeah. No, you, you were a Red Bull junior at one point, is that right? Yeah. 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 As a helmet reminds me quite often now working with him, <laughs> um, yeah, with drivers as opposed to him sort of, yeah, nailing me as one of the drivers. Yeah. That's quite kind of cool, actually, because obviously, you know, seeing the other side of it and being able to relate as well with a lot of the, the young guys, what they're going through. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's quite handy. Um, did you, your dad, did he have a little bit of something to do with your career? Um, uh, time? Yeah, yeah, yeah. My dad, um, he raced himself. He's pretty, pretty passionate, like all dads whose kids race. Um, yeah. And I think yeah, I guess it's kind of natural, isn't it? Your parents either have been around it and love it or they are the ones who sort of support you to get into it. So in my case, I'm pretty lucky, actually. Both my mum and dad uh, love racing. And uh, actually, <laughs> my mum makes me laugh because she probably follows it more than anyone, messaging me after a weekend, whether it was good or bad, giving me sort of bits of love and support, which is pretty cool, yeah. Yeah. And maybe a two penneth as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, definitely. And it's kind of funny. They, a couple of the guys who are here, actually, they, they go way back. Um, so they even know my parents before I was driving, which is quite, quite weird, but cool at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so so you, how did you get to be in the position that you're in, you know, being director? Um, yeah, kind of, kind of odd, actually. Um, I... Yeah, originally, I think back in 2015 or 14, there wasn't really many teams from England, to be honest, back in the old F3 before it came under sort of supporting Formula One. There was pretty much the, the top teams were sort of uh, Prema and ART, who are still, <laughs> still around. Um, and me here and uh, sort of uh, two of my shareholders um, who aren't really into racing, but they're massively sporty and into it um the theory was sort of it'd be nice to have a new team that could go toe to toe with those sort of european teams that kind of um taken over a bit from from the brits in that period um yeah and it kind of started like that and i think there wasn't really any roadmap it sort of evolved um step by step and it was kind of weird today like when i look now at all the things high tech sort of does and obviously F2 is our, the top of the tree, but we've only been in that for sort of half a year last year. <laughs> um, so it sort of all happened quite quick, but yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. And can you just sort of describe the, the growth of high tech over those few years, you know, through, through, through F3, you know, to, to get to where you are now, you know, moving up to F2? Yeah. So, um, yeah, it was kind of, kind of odd, obviously, um, end of 18, um, let's say Formula 3 joined F1 as a support series. And we've been doing that um, back when it was with, with DTM. So we sort of stayed with it as it sort of joined the F1 platform, which was really cool actually, because racing in front of F1, sort of you're there with the teams, the tracks, the whole environment. It, it's a really good thing to be part of. And obviously not even everyone documents working with, with young drivers, but actually 
a bigger part of that is your younger mechanics, younger engineers as well, who feed through you onto F1 as well. So that's been a really good, good platform. And um, sort of during that, um, we obviously had uh, 2019, a really good first year um, with Yuri actually, who's back with us in F2, which is kind of, kind of cool. Um, and when, when we got to the end of 2020, actually one of our previous drivers, uh, Nikita, um, he'd been doing F2 uh, for the first year with, with ART and it had a bit of a, a tricky year. And we obviously knew him well here. Um, his dad's been a big sort of supporter uh, of high tech uh, over the years. Um, and it was kind of natural really that he didn't have a berth in F2 and we were looking to sort of get back into it. And it's really weird how things unfold in, in racing. You know, I see that time and time again now that sort of that came off for us to, to enter F2. Um, Bruno was looking for another team as well to join. Um, and it sort of all, all fell into place very late, <laughs> sort of middle of December to give us sort of two months to get ready. Um, but actually, yeah, it's kind of fun now because we've got both teams in both series and it works really well, especially, you know, this year with our F2 lineup of sort of two drivers who've been in high tech through F3 into F2. And that was sort of always the, the ladder we wanted to have really to to keep them with you and growing in the team. It's really nice to see them sort of come of age, actually. It's a, a weird feeling. You almost feel like you've sort of brought them up a little bit and it's kind of proud, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I see, you know, there are other teams that obviously do that, you know, uh, Carly and Prama, yeah. you know, and, and they do sort of nurse the, these young drivers into uh you know potential formula one drivers so i can absolutely see the appeal in that but to see them develop you know and uh, nikita you know obviously if you've, as you've mentioned was with you um you know he helped you get get that second place in 2016 I, I think it was and then i think he got his own third place you know the year after um and you know with yori obviously you know he that that uh, second place for both team and him and yes, to see Liam too, you know, and then suddenly this year that they're with you in Formula 2. And um, I totally agree. It's absolutely, it's, I don't know what it is. It's just a wonderful feeling to, to feel these guys are, are with you throughout these stages of their career too. Um, yeah, it's a really, it's a really nice, nice thing. And it, you know, there's a lot of emotion, a lot of, um, you know, heartbreak you, you go through together. But actually, it's kind of, it's part of the the challenge that we like and it, it it's really it's really hard to describe but for us it was also something that that seemed a bit missing when we did just f3 um you know i saw that we had george russell with us back in old f3 in 2016 as our first driver and you know he obviously then went off to art and uh, gp3 and f2 and and now it's nice because we can almost offer that for guys to to stay with us and you know it, it's really it's really fun at the moment with Yuri and Liam because I've obviously known them for sort of um, well two to three years now and they they get on really well and it's a great dynamic to have in the team um, and then on the other side in in F3 we've got some real youngsters there I think our average age is 16 this year which is just bonkers we you know for better or worse I went for a really inexperienced lineup and actually they're amazing for their age the the talent of the three of them but it's a really fun thing you've sort of got um both sides of the coin with the two teams and it, it's really good yeah yeah for, for high tech was it always a plan to be in f2 it, it just took a few years yeah i mean it, it's one of those things where like it sort of was always in our direction to to grow the team um but the plan was more actually uh to organically grow into that in two or three years time so we had quite um a young group back in F3, particularly mechanics and engineering. My sort of uh, chief engineer, Christoph and me, our vision was to grow younger guys. Um, and when we, when we found out we were sort of doing F2, it was like, oh gosh, <laughs> we, we can't suddenly like move everyone. Um, so actually we sort of split, split up a little bit. I obviously with COVID bubbles and stuff last year, I, I was stuck pretty much with F2 most of the year. Um, and the guys in F3 sort of say, stayed the same stayed together um and it it was good because it made the team strong um and it was kind of a, a mad year for me because my 
my daughter was born on December the 27th. So I'd sort of just found out sort of two weeks before I had to do F2. And then she came into the world. And then obviously, you know, we geared up for Bahrain uh, and then COVID hit. <laughs> and then, yeah, sort of during COVID, we decided to enter British F3 as well as a company because we had some requests from drivers and with W Series being postponed, they had sort of 12 guys who were sat around. Um, so we kind of probably create our own stress really a little bit, but it was nice because everything came off uh, really well last year and um, credit to, to everyone here actually, yeah. Yeah, and you just mentioned briefly there about the COVID pandemic. And so, yeah, you were all ready for last season and suddenly this global, you know, lockdown happened. So yeah. how did that, you know, affect you at the beginning of the season? And, you know, from what you were expecting to sort of happen. And then, you know, how did it sort of continue to affect you throughout 2020? Yeah, so it was one of those things where I guess initially it was a bit a bit frustrating because you sort of rushed to get everything ready. You know, you, um, in our case, uh, I can't really explain how much pain it was to sort of in the two months get everything ready, like aside from, you know, just people gelling and getting up to speed you also have to build two new cars you've got all the freight boxes everything and it's just uh, the list was just endless <laughs> and you sort of get to Bahrain you do that test and we're like by sort of day two lunchtime we're like oh actually we're looking pretty good actually Luca and Nikita they're both doing a good job and then sort of you end the test and you're sort of buzzing okay we're kind of ready and then it was like oh Covid's come we're not racing we're like oh my god like <laughs> we've done all this work um, but actually, I think it really did help us, to be honest, as a new team, because it gave us a little bit more time to just to get prepared. And I don't think there was anything sort of dramatic that we weren't ready with, but it was more actually just getting to know everybody. Um, and obviously, when COVID did hit, uh, in my case, and then the, so we had one or two months where we weren't racing, uh, there's lots of meetings and things gearing up but the bigger thing was sort of when we did go racing again obviously we had to be in bubbles we were away for sort of three week stints on the road which was really hard for the guys but actually I think for the team to sort of gel and get to know each other it was really good um, I wouldn't want to do it every year <laughs> but <laughs> I think for that sort of season crammed into those months it was it was pretty special and um I just think the whole COVID thing, everybody's had to adapt to what they're doing. You know, Zoom meetings like this and uh, other things have become our way of life. And we're sort of laughing even today. The, for me, as a, the boss of the company, it, it's actually been helpful because you learn how to interact with sort of the, I guess we've got something like 50 people and four teams. You've sort of managed to communicate much better, actually, than what you did in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll totally agree on, on the opportunity. Of course, you know, there's, there has been a lot of devastation in the world from it. But, you know, the opportunity to, to meet people like this, you know, over Zoom, it's, it's opened up a completely new world. Um, and I think that, it, that it's opened up the world of Formula 2, uh, to be honest, which, which is great for existing fans and for, and for new fans and followers of the sport. Um, so, so with all that in mind, did you expect to finish in fourth place last season? Um, I don't know. It, it was a weird one. I was pretty annoyed in Bahrain when uh, we threw away sort of P3, actually, because Nikita, bless him, had some misdemeanours. Um, in all honesty, I, I think it's one of those weird things that, yeah, we're kind of happy about it. On the other side, we're, we're racers and we... We always think, well, you know, we should be here to win. What are we doing? And I think sort of feet on the ground, you go, yeah, that was good. That was a good first year. Um, but we also left sort of a bit frustrated because when we look at sort of some of the points we, we threw away for whatever reasons, whether it was sort of uh, <laughs> steward penalties or, you know, some mistakes we made as a new team. To be honest, the, the first two races in Austria were absolutely a nightmare. <laughs> For sort of our mistakes you know the drivers were were there on the pace and you know mixing it in the top five but you know when you look back on it you go god I hope nobody really sits there with a calculator and adds that up <laughs> but yeah all in all it was it was positive and to be honest the main thing was you know I felt like we 
we came in and hit the ground running, which is kind of our ethos of everything new we, we've ever done. We don't take sort of one or two years to figure it out. We can go in and do the job straight away. And that that was good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, you, you, you shouldn't really go into this thinking, oh, well, if we, if we get one point, that'll be great. You know, at the end of the day, you are a racing team. You, you existed in Formula 3. You had some incredible drivers on that, you know, lineup. And I guess that very first weekend was a bit like, oh, you know, and yeah. <laughs> especially after the testing, because in a way, it did, did it um, kind of like brawn reminiscent, really, of, of 2009, <laughs> maybe being that surprise initially in that testing of, hey, Hey, actually, we've got a, a really good car here. I don't know. Yeah, it was. Like it that. was a bit. It was a bit like that. I think it's always funny because obviously, I've been a driver, and there, there's two sides, the good and bad of that. But the bad is you're always kind of sticking up for the drivers. And now the team can make the car better, and this, <laughs> and the sort of good bit is you you do understand sort of now. In my case, both sides of it really. It's the package. It's the way. The drivers trust the team. The team's able to give the drivers the car they want, but also be honest with the drivers what they need to do to, to adapt to that. And I think it's sort of funny when you, you start something new. Initially, you're sort of treading on eggshells and sort of going, well, you know, who's right? Are the team right? Are the drivers right? And it was funny by that sort of day two in Bahrain, I could sort of see already going, God, you know, we've got a good group here. It just needs time. And it, it's funny because it's probably your your proudest part as the sort of boss or I hate that word really because I think everybody sort of we're one team but when you do stand back and see that happening it, it's kind of that is probably the coolest moment yeah yeah I suppose this season there's a little bit more pressure you know on on Liam and Yuri because of last year's success you know and, and they're, they've had high expectations on their shoulders this season to perform bring their expertise to the team as well as you know join that with yours so just share a little bit of your thoughts and feelings on your driver's performances so far this season yeah I mean I think at the end of the day any any of these kids who who sort of go into F2 they're they're all doing it because they you know they're aiming for f1 and they know what's at stake and i think it's quite interesting to see how how each driver does adapt to that you know some it can be too big a burden on their shoulders some are completely blasé um and in my case you know with those two i know what they're they're capable of they are two talented boys but also they're good kids and it, it's really a lot of fun having them in the team and it is funny because they're both very different one is you know Estonian and one is from New Zealand you know and actually I've known them both through sort of the F3 time and into F2 so I know you know they're good and bad parts um, and and to be honest you know I think having them with us is a good advantage because we know them and you know we know what we need to sort of give them in order to perform and I know sort of when they need a hug and a, a sort of kick as well. <laughs> and, you know, I think so far this year, it, they've been they've been great. You know, F2, as you know, and probably the guys listening who obviously watch a lot of races in that, it, it's very up and down as a series. It, it's so competitive. Um, and that, you know, that's also by the makeup of the format um, in terms of the way you qualify, then you have a reverse grid. Um, and also the way the, the circuits we visit, you know, you've got a mix of real circuits, street circuits, and then you've got the double-edged sword there that you've got some guys in the series who've been in it a long time against really good rookies. So there's all these things that sort of, you know, if you were to put it all together in a spreadsheet and try and make a prediction as to what's going to happen, it, it's always impossible. Um, and I, I think that's a great, great challenge. And in our case so far this year, um, there's been some some great moments. Um, you know, I think sort of Liam winning in Bahrain as a rookie there was was massive. Um, obviously, Yuri just doing well in Baku was was a huge sort of monkey off his back. But there's also been some moments where we've had to have sort of a, a quiet word with ourselves as a team and even the drivers with little things. You know, um, you know, we made a big a big mistake to be honest in qualifying in Bahrain, which was heartbreaking to sort of affect Yuri's weekend like that and then you sort of recover from that psychologically and we we got him back to sort of 
uh, in a position to recover the weekend and we had that failure and it was just like, God, we've been punched twice <laughs> here. But, you know, they've both handled that so well so far. And for me, that is the key to sort of doing well in F2, that you've got to just really stick together through thick and thin. Um, and it was something last year that, you know, as a new team, I can't give enough credit to, to Nikita and Luca for, for really helping us with that because, you know, we did, <laughs> we made innocent mistakes and I think really good drivers are ones you can sort of build a team together with. And actually we've been very fortunate on that side. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. I think it's totally ad admirable. You know, I know they're experienced, but they are still young men to come back from, you know, obviously Yuri's beginning. It, it seemed like all the luck was just against him. And, you know, with Liam, even with that disqualification for him to come back and still put in these great performances. Um, and, and I congratulate you as well on that double in Baku this weekend, you know, that, that double win and podium. And, and I'm sure, you know, that, that Yuri is celebrating, especially after after uh, those first couple of sessions where um, it was like Liam had sort of learned off the data from, from Yuri. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and it kind, of yeah. it kind of switched around and it felt yeah. like, oh, you know, Yuri's going to be unlucky again. And then look, I'm, look I'm sure him. that, uh, yeah, the banter between them for that's going to be going to be ongoing. Because actually, you know, it, it's kind of funny that how it always, it, it swings in roundabouts. Yeah, and I, I sort of, that race free in Baku, I was thinking, God, you know they're both starting together and last year when we had that in uh, Mugello Nikita and Luca ended up on top of each other the day after we just had a one-two <laughs> and you sort of go for god's sake but you know to be fair to them both they're they are working really well together and I'm really impressed by it because actually having been a driver you know I think about all the things that sort of go through your head with your teammate you know what the team tells you can you trust them or not and ultimately they're a credit to sort of Red Bull, actually, that they both are proper hard racers, but they they know what they've got to do on track. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, you were talking earlier a little bit about the format regarding the races, but um, regarding the, the format for uh, separating Formula Two and Formula Three this season, um, how, how is that working for you as a team now? Uh, you know, is it the same personnel that are now going, going to be travelling to each race? You know, how, how is that working for both championships? Yeah, so obviously, um, yeah, it's been documented. Yeah, now they're on standalone weekends. Um, and I think the, yeah, the original idea with that was sort of for some teams, they, they could share staff so it would help reduce costs. And I think every team, you know, I'm realising that now I'm only uh, an overnight team boss, as Trevor tells me sometimes <laughs> as a youngster in the room. But um, I, every team sort of got a different structure. Um, and in our, our case, sort of based in the UK, we, you know, travel times are a bit more and we have different uh, employment rules and this stuff. So as a team, we don't share too much stuff between the two, simply because it's a bit difficult for us with the way the travel work, the calendars. Like, to give you an example, um, with F2, we came back on, uh, well, we got back the early hours of Monday uh, from Baku. And actually, the F3 drivers are in this week doing their preparation, uh, ready for Paul Ricard next week. And the mechanics are just finishing the F3 cars off to go in the truck. <laughs> so it's a bit tricky, like, in all honesty, to share more people. Um, at the moment, I have sort of one um, engineer who does both, uh, which is quite nice because actually it's also quite handy having some who do both because they kind of, the crossover between the teams isn't just me. It's actually someone else also saying, ah, oh, I saw that in F3. Why don't you do that in F2? Um, and I think the other thing is that um, in all honesty, like when it was the weekends with both teams there, it was very busy, to be honest, um, particularly for the technical support. And even for someone like me, to be honest, I couldn't join both teams for every meeting. Uh, whereas now sort of going to each event with an individual team, it's a bit easier to be fully part of it. Um, but I think, yeah, I think it, it's worked well for quite a few teams, particularly some of the European ones. Um, but in my case also, we sort of the way our truck journey times and stuff leaving from the UK it's kind of hard as well to just say 
right? You're going to get off the plane from Baku, go and prep for a free car now. It doesn't kind of work like that. <laughs> yeah. Some are probably still enjoying their Baku weekend at home. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I imagine. Yeah. But I think it, it's nice. The other thing I sorry I didn't touch on was okay. potentially it's quite nice for the, the different groups to follow, actually. Like when the F2 group's racing, it's nice because the F3 guys can really follow that now. Whereas actually before they weren't really part of it. So actually internally here, it's been quite cool. In my case, you know, you have all these um, like Zoom, we have that Microsoft Teams and all that stuff. And actually the sort of um, internal support because the F3 groups and F2 aren't on track at the same time. That's been quite nice, actually. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was just wondering as well, like what, what's the team's role in preparing a driver for Formula One? And, you know, you mentioned earlier, obviously, about all your experience, including the Red Bull Juniors, which is quite handy for, for both Liam and Yuri right now. So do you have any personal involvement as well in any way, you know, into developing them further for the next stage? No, I mean, it's kind of odd. They obviously... In terms of the the Red Bull guys, like uh, Helmut uh, is probably you know the number one guy in the world. To be fair, it amazes me. He's <laughs> he's aware of what's going on in F1 and all the way down the ladder. You know whether he's ringing me to chat about the guys who are with me in F2 or F3 or chasing me on what's going on in the karting world. It it amazes me how his fingers on the pulse for for what's happening. But in terms of the the sort of drivers when they're they're here. Um, what typically happens is the Red Bull guys have um, stuff that they do with Red Bull, which will be their sort of some training, uh, some sim stuff. Um, and they do that in and around the stuff they do with the, with the team, with us. So what kind of happens uh, today is a, a good example, actually, well, the F3 guys are in the building for, <laughs> for two days, um, just when you want to break off the back. <laughs> and yeah. Um, and you, and you and you you you're a dad as well. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so they they come in and they'll basically do a a meeting with with their engineers where they'll go through the track that's coming up. Um, so kind of their run plan for the weekend, the driving plans, things to watch out for. Um, and they they'll spend half a day sort of doing that. They even do um a bit of a quiz as well. Sometimes we, <laughs> we do that. So they know regulations and, and different things, which is great to see who's been studying and, and who hasn't. Um, and then they basically join uh, the simulator sessions individually to prepare the weekend. Um, and they do that with their actual race engineer. So they're already working together, preparing the weekend. Um, and typically at the moment, it's a bit more different because of COVID. We tend to do that a little bit earlier than what we did in the past. In the past, we would do it closer to the race weekend because then we'd sort of travel together out to the event. Um, the drivers get there, they they unpack all their kit. Um, hopefully they've remembered everything. And hopefully <laughs> and they've got the right size, yeah. Exactly, yeah. In, in Yuri's <laughs> case, he's measured himself well in the winter. Um, and then, uh, yeah, and then we go track walk and the weekend starts, yeah. But, I mean, in terms of actually developing young guys, what what amazes me today is, you know, take my F3 guys, for example, little uh, Jack, who's there, Crawford. He was only 15 when he tested with us last year. And I was thinking, man, I didn't sit in a race car till I was 17. And like, <laughs> he's already, you know, he's so advanced for his age. And what, what I think the job of us to do with the young guys is really to, to just help them understand what throws at them and how to handle that. Um, because to be honest, by the time they get to us now, most of the time, they're pretty good as drivers, really. They just need their edges sort of refined. Um, and it, it's very different. You know, we've got um, little uh, Ayu, who's first year in FAF free straight from Japan. Um, he's a hybrid. He's almost a bit like Yuki. He's with Honda and Red Bull. Um, and it's a huge step for him. He's just done one year of racing in French F4 last year. So... He's sort of now living in the UK straight over. Um, and with him, it, it's probably more different that it's getting used to living in the UK, um, getting to know the team, uh, improving his English. Um, and that, that's really fun as well, because each driver needs something, something different. Yeah. 
But you mentioned a little bit earlier about um, the teams, the European teams having sort of a more, a, a, a bigger advantage, maybe being closer to track, less travel time. But I'm, I'm just sitting here as we're chatting, wondering with you being based at Silverstone, is that an, a, an advantage over the European teams with, with sort of being right in the melting pot of all the Formula One teams around you? You know, is there any advantages to that? Um, yeah, I guess, I guess with all of it, it's sort of pros and cons, because actually, I think the biggest advantage where we are here is we're in Motorsport Valley. So, you know, there's good and bad of that. The bad is sort of your good people. F1's always trying to, <laughs> to chase them from you. Um, and, you know, the sort of good part is everything is on your doorstep. And in my case, I really enjoy it. You know, I'm sort of close to quite a few of the F1 teams with different drivers having been here. And there's always good synergies that come from that. You know, a prime example, though nothing track related, is that at the moment it's quite easy to get a COVID test around here because <laughs> obviously all four teams need that regularly. Um, so that that's quite a help. But I think the main main thing of being based at Silverstone really is, you know, in England, everything is sort of in this area. Um, you know, and that, that can be for the drivers who are based here. It's easy for the sim with us training. You know, those who are Red Bull juniors, uh, Red Bulls in Milton Keynes. Um, so there is, there is really good advantages of it. Um, and for me, uh, you know, I'm British, so I'm quite happy we're based here. <laughs> so what does the future hold then for high tech? You know, what's the team's direction? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I, I think now it, pretty much just more of the same we obviously rushing last year like we did to twin threat two was pretty tricky internally because you're sort of moving people around and you know i'd say at the moment we've still got to you know keep strengthening what we're doing um obviously it, it's weird at the moment with motorsport obviously we follow what f1 does in terms of rules they drip feed down to us and i think it, it's interesting because um <laughs> My partner, Becca, she was sort of laughing with me the other day, actually. She's got an electric road car, yeah. And, you know, she sort of said, oh, you know, you guys will all be doing this one. Then I was like, God, will we? And you sort of laugh, but we can't plan anything. You know, I hope we continue doing what we're doing, which is winning on track and working with young drivers, because that is what really motivates us. Um, but I think in terms of other series and things we do, I think it all, all just depends what, what comes up. I personally really enjoy at the moment, uh, the balance we've got with sort of F2 and F3. Um, I think obviously it'd be nice maybe to, to add something uh, a bit lower as well, because from my links in karting, what tends to happen is sort of kids come in the door, do a bit of preparation with us, and then we ship them off to sort of F4 teams and we avoid that a bit with the, the karting dads <laughs> and that type of stuff. And then they come back to us, um, but seeing sort of how nice it's been having Yuri and Liam stay with us on the ladder. That's obviously a, a natural thing. And I think to be fair to, to Rene at Prema, him and his dad do a really good, good job with that. Um, you know, sort of Rene is busy with the F2, F3 and his dad's got the youngsters sort of coming through. And, you know, I think they do a fantastic job and that's obviously one, one route we could take. Um, I think obviously uh, Francois Dams, you know, they've, they've done a brilliant job with, running f2 and formula e that seems a good good balance so we'll have to wait and see yeah at the moment i'm enjoying what we're doing yeah yeah well maybe one day you know with f4 as well there might even be f1 who knows all the way <laughs> through the ladder yeah no yeah that yeah who knows but at the moment i've probably got enough to be doing yeah, yeah. oh well i can't thank you enough ollie for this incredibly illuminating discussion on yourself and on the high tech team we're all very much looking forward to seeing what high tech can achieve in formula two um, and I, you know i'm really looking forward to see seeing you develop these young drivers as well so you know thanks again for joining me no more than welcome thanks very much and thank you for watching inside chat it's been good to have you with us don't forget to watch our other videos and content on YouTube and all our other social platforms. The links are all in the description and you know what to do. Like and subscribe if you want to stay up to date with all of our Formula 2 content. See you next time.